This is a recording made in the chapter of the open book and is number four devoted to the title The Son. It is our custom at this meeting to read a portion of scripture together. So those of you who are listening to this recording, if you care to join us, will you switch off for a little while and read with us the first two chapters of the Epistle to the Hebrews. You do remember that the Apostle himself has written, Confessedly great is the mystery of godliness. Here is one whose preeminent title is the Son. Yet the angels are called upon to worship him. And as far as I understand, angels would not do anything or be called upon to do anything that was blasphemous and yet to worship anyone lower than God seems to be opposite to all the teaching of scripture. Yet I feel somehow that if I may put it without exceeding my bounds that God, God as God does not appear in the Bible. He's back and away and beyond all possibility of being written about or explained or speaking or doing or even creating. Now I know I'm asking for trouble, but you see, this very first chapter of the Epistle to the Hebrews, he speaks about him as the Son. But I would like to draw your attention to a thing, a, a feature. I've said it before. And I hope that every one of you will pardon me if I appear to be repeating myself, because it contains in itself a rather wonderful statement. The first two verses of Hebrews 1. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, we are told by Peter in the Acts of the Apostles and elsewhere that the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David, spake. So now we've got to bring the Holy Ghost into it as well. For God spoke, and the Holy Spirit spoke to the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Or as it stands, it's true. But that isn't what it says. I've mentioned this before, but it's so wonderful a statement that it's worth repeating. The word his is in italic. And therefore you know that it's not in the original. And yet nobody could say it was good English to say, hath in these last days spoken unto us by son. And then you discover the word is in. And then you go back to the Old Testament and read the original and you'll find a, a passages where it says, and God spoke in the Almighty. Or God spoke in Jehovah. The one passage I've got noted down, if you'd like to take the note, is Exodus chapter 6, verse 3. If you have ability to look at the original and read the words, you'll see that God spoke in El Shaddai. It's just a little light let in, that without an image, not one of us would have the least conception of God at all. You say to me, God is a person. Well, I believe with all my heart God is here and God is everywhere on this round world where two or three meet together. But I also understand that this is just on the edge of the Milky Way and millions of light years away, God's there just as much as he's here, but how he can be a person, I don't know. Do you? And the whole thing would baffle us beyond the ability to describe if he hadn't put the whole thing in this new shape. He has assumed these various titles. Elohim, when you look at the first verse of Genesis, chapter 1, we were looking at that last Sunday morning, we have Moses writing to a people who'd been in a land steep with idolatry. And if he could have avoided putting a plural word, for God he would have done it. But he had to put Elohim, 
because that was the truth. And there must be some point where we read, let us make man in our image. Or when our Saviour in John 17 says, that they may be one in us. Now, I'm not explaining it, friends. I'm only saying, hold back a bit. One day we shall know, even as we are known. But I'm quite conscious of this, that if all the angels of God are called upon to worship him, I need not withhold it. And I do remind myself that in John the fifth chapter, I think it is, it says that we cannot worship the Father if we withhold the self same from the Son. And so we just realise that this Son of God occupies a place that begins with Genesis 1 verse 1. For he is the beginning of the creation of God. Not as some have misinterpreted Colossians 1 where it says he's the firstborn of all creation for the first one to be created. But that isn't what Paul said. Paul said he's the firstborn of all creation because he created all things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible. That's universal creation. And then he upholds all things by the word of his power, that one who died for our sins. And by him all things are held together, consist. And when you come to the book of the Revelation, you read that he is called the Almighty. And when he comes to reign, we read, The Lord God Omnipotent reigneth. Well now, on Sunday morning, we had just before us the three titles. Creation, God. Dealing with men, the Lord God. And then, the guarantee behind, when he said, I am almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. So we're looking at various phases and teachings of scripture concerning this son. Now, having said all that, if we explain away the flesh and the manhood of Christ, we have no saviour. For right through the scriptures, every single reference to a redeemer in the Old Testament is the word that means your next of kin. There is the solitary exception even if it says God is the creator or the God of Israel is the next of kin if he's called a redeemer. So you see, the manhood of Christ is vital to us. Without that manhood there would be no offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. He came into this world miraculously. He came into this world saying something. I know children are born into this world yelling, and I believe I did, but before ever he was born, he said, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. No, I come. So now this is the Son of God that is dominating the book from Genesis 1, creation, to 1 Corinthians 15, then coming the end. And he lays at the feet, not of God, I'm quoting scripture, he lays at the feet of the Father. Because some people tell you that right through the Old Testament, it's God the Father, but you won't find him there. There are only about two references to the fatherhood of God in the whole of the Old Testament, and it puts it like this, like as a father pities his children. Well, that's hardly stating that God is the Father. And so we've got this dominance, preeminence of the Son, that in all things he might have the preeminence. What will take place when the end is reached and all enemies are, are destroyed and God is all in all? You better ask somebody else because I don't know. Isn't that wonderful? There's something I don't know, friends. And I think the less we speculate, and the more we take what the scripture says as far as we can and leave the rest without argument, the better we shall be and our witness clearer. Now then the son, the one who took upon himself the nature of man, it says, 
verse four, uh, 14 that we read just now. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. So he was made a little lower than the angels. Now the reason why it says in chapter 1 he has a more excellent name than the angels, you say, well, anybody who can be the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, must certainly be better than angels. Oh, yes. But then he, he, he voluntarily came lower than the angels. And by inheritance, not by his own divine power, by inheritance, he has become above the angels. And by that fact, he can take us with him. John 17 reveals there are two aspects of the glory of Christ. There's the glory that he had with the Father before the world began. And there's the glory that he has because of his redemptive work that we can share. In the one, no sharing. That's beyond us. In the other, yes. So I think that we'll concentrate our attention on some of the outstanding statements concerning this son. And the first thing we do is to go back to the fact that the New Testament opens with a pedigree, a genealogy. Matthew, the first chapter. In the book of Chronicles, the first book of Chronicles, we have about eight or nine chapters with just one mass of names. And of course, if people solidly plow through the Bible and read their portion, I'm not quite sure whether that's what God intended, that you should read a certain part of 1 Chronicles chapter 1. It starts off with the words Adam, Seth, Enoch, a long list of names, but all their most vital. Somerset House is a most wonderful place, but you don't go there just to spend a half an hour reading. And Somerset House is just what one, one chronicles the first few chapters are. It traces from Adam without a break right through to the days of David a little bit on further. After that, of course, it came to a conclusion for the time being. But in Matthew, the first chapter, it's taken up and one or two things I think may be useful for us to remember. It opens with the words, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. And that expression occurs nowhere else except in the book of Genesis when it says the book of the generations of Adam. There are only two books. And there are two Adams. Adam the first, who was made a living soul, and the last Adam, who is a life-giving spirit. In which book are you? Well, we've all come into this world associated with the first Adam, who was of the earth, earthy. But by the mercy of God there's a gospel, whereby we may believe, and we may pass from death unto life, and we may find in Christ a Redeemer indeed. So, don't think there's a waste of time for the moment in looking at these opening genealogy. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, you see, David is put first because the great point in Matthew is that he was the king. But Abraham, of course, comes first here in verse 2. And we go right down this story and we end in uh, verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14, from David to the Babylonian captivity 14, and from the Babylonian captivity unto Christ 14. But if you were to count them all, you would discover that the generations which are picked out here, a few have been omitted. Because, you see, most of these things were written in order to facilitate memory. The acrostic psalms, all the things that were done to enable people to keep things in their memory. And you've lost nothing because, if, supposing I put it this way, if you and I were going up a flight of stairs today, you would go up possibly two at a time, and I should go up one at a time and stop on a landing. 
But it wouldn't matter whether you went one at a time or two at a time. You're going up the same staircase, you get the same top just the same. So if I have a genealogy of everybody's grandfather and grandmother, I'll get the same place. So don't think there's anything lost unless you want every particular put in. And if you do go back to the proper place, 1 Chronicles, chapter 1 to about chapter 9, and you can read all the names. But whether you'll understand them all, or whether they'll be very much help to you, I don't know. So here we have that. Now, there's a moment where we must stop for a minute. Because we know that there's an enemy in the scriptures. And he doesn't really come in the New Testament. He's there at the beginning. And his enmity is expressed by the statement in Genesis 3.15 against the seed of the woman. Now this is, a, this is David's seed, elsewhere spoken of, and this is David's son. And he comes right the way down from Eve by an unbroken succession through Judah. So we're not, we're not surprised to discover that at long last, in the Old Testament, a king whose name was Jeconiah had the first letters of his name removed because they stand for the name Jehovah. And he was called Coniah. God wouldn't allow him to have that precious name, Jeconiah. And he said, write this man childless. And then it tells you the names of some of his children. You say, oh, there's a book. Who's going to worry about that? Say, you worry a bit more and read what it says. Write this man childless, for he shall have no son to sit upon the throne of David. He's got sons, and their names are given, and one of their names are here. But he never sit upon the throne of his father David. Now the name that is here is in verse 12 of this Matthew 1. And after that, they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias begat Salafiel. Jeconias, that's one of his sons. Salafiel. But Salafiel could never, never sit upon the throne of his father David. At this moment, Satan had cut him. And he could sit back and rub his hands together if he ever does, I don't know, and think, well, that's what I spoke in that. But, it sometimes is only a very simple thing that can alter a destiny. So will you turn to Luke's Gospel? Luke's Gospel? Some of you anticipate me over this, I know, but if I'm speaking for the benefit of all who shall listen to this, and if I have to repeat, well, that's all to the good. Luke's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 23. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed. Now, this is a genealogy again. And while... It's um, right to say he was supposed to be the son of Joseph. Yet legally, he was the son of Joseph. Joseph had paid his redemption money. Joseph had stood by, and he was legally responsible. But Matthew 1 tells you that he had no human father. He fulfilled the prophecy that a virgin should conceive and bear a son, and the whole thing's borne out by the attitude of Joseph, who minded first of all to put his uh, betrothed wife away. But nevertheless, here he was supposed, but the word nomizo, N-O-M-O-S, is the word law. And the word nomizo is reckoned or accounted legally. So there's a possibility that we ought not to be have supposition here. It's telling you that in this genealogy, he was legally reckoned to be the son of, of Joseph. Now, the son of Joseph is said to be the son of Heli. Well, that's a different name from the one we get in Matthew. But you say, oh, well, perhaps he had two names. All right. Which was the son of Mephat, which was the son of Levi, which was... None of these names are the same. Did all these ancestors all have two names and conveniently put one down in one and the... Oh, no. Don't you see... This is carrying on the word son-in-law. Because no pedigree is traced in the Bible through a woman. It always is traced through a man. And even to this day, 
You get not only fogged up if you trace your pedigree back through both your father and your mother, you'll be in the same pickle that the man was in who sent the uh, question up to the BBC. He says, how is it? I've got two parents, four grandfathers, grandmothers, eight great, oh, the further you, nearer you get back to as they said, the more millions of ancestors I've got. And the poor wretches on the brain trust couldn't answer it, so they had to dig at Adam. But don't you see, you go through one parent, and you get back to Adam, it's all right. So here we are. This is the son in law. This is, no pedigree can go through Mary, but this is Mary's pedigree. Well, you say, how do you know that? Well, look down a little bit further, where we have um, the reference to David. Verse 32 which was the son of uh, Medea, which was the son of Minan, which was the son of Metatha, which was the son of Nathan. Now do you know that David had two sons? And one comes in the pedigree of Matthew 1, the other comes in the pedigree of Luke. In Matthew's pedigree, Christ is descended from Solomon, the son of David. In Luke's pedigree, is descended from Nathan, the son of David. And Nathan would have been his uncle, according to this. So well, where are we now? Well, if you look again in this pedigree, you'll see that Salafiel comes into the story, as we found just now. Uh, can anyone see where it comes? What verse is that? 27. What name? 27. Thank you. Oh, yes. Well, now, Salafiel's in both of them. Well, how does he get there? Well, if he's still the son-in-law, a little marriage upset the whole devastating plan of Satan. When it was pronounced that no one of this king's seed should ever sit upon the throne of David, there was a little romance going on at the same time, and Salafiel married somebody who belonged to the other line of David, Nathan, and it carries on, and Christ unites the double pedigree in his own person and sits upon the throne and fulfills it all. But there's something more. In this pedigree of Luke 3, I come to verse 38. You see, I, uh, Matthew's pedigree is content if it goes back as far as Abraham because he's dealing with the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But Luke is the right-hand man of the Apostle Paul, the Apostle of the Gentiles. And Paul and Luke are the only ones in the New Testament who even mention Adam. No other one in the New Testament ever mentions him. So this is where we come in. Luke's Gospel has got a word for us. And you know, some of the statements in Luke would never have appeared in Matthew. I can't quite believe that Matthew would be very happy writing about a good Samaritan. But Luke did, you see. And Luke anticipates the justification by faith that Paul spoke about when he spoke about, I tell you, that man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Or when the prodigal son who goes into a far country comes back again and the elder brother is jealous, you see. All Luke is dealing with the Gentile element coming in. So, how wonderfully then, the genealogy of Matthew fits its purpose, the descendant of David to be the king, and the genealogy of Luke 3 fits its purpose, and takes us right down past the whole lot, until we get to Adam at the end. So that, while I don't pretend to have solved all the problems, I believe I've put the key in the door for you. And if you could discover any further of the ways in which these intricacies can be flattened out, don't be afraid to say so, for I should be grateful indeed. But I do believe you see enough to realise that there's no mistakes here. It was well known by the people who read it, and if they were satisfied, I think we can well be. Because, don't you see, the Pharisees and the scribes the leaders of the people were absolutely antagonistic to Christ. 
They charged him with all sorts of things which were untrue. But they never once said he was not the son of David. Because the temple contained the whole documents and they could be brought out for evidence at any time. Well now this son figures in the scriptures in more ways than one, but particularly in the Gospels and the Epistles. So let us use what little time we have, I hope I haven't wasted time, in just noticing how the different titles come. Now the sun, standing just by itself, Romans, the first chapter, and the ninth verse. Romans, of course, is the great epistle, basic epistle of the doctrine upon which our hopes of salvation rest, and Paul there speaks about himself as being separated unto the gospel of God. And then after the interval of verse 2, he says that gospel of God is concerning his son. So the whole focus of the gospel is on his son. And John picks it up and says, He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So the Son, you see, is most focal and central. But then further down when he speaks about the Gospel again, he just uses the word Son without any further definition. Verse 9, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the Gospel of his Son his son. There are other passages. One I think perhaps I'd, I'd like you to look at is John 5, 19. John 5 is a wonderful chapter to consider by itself. It arose out of the, the uh, objection that they had to healing a man on the Sabbath day. And our Saviour said in rebuke to them, verse 17, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Now some people tell you that because the father and the son are there, that he cannot be equal. Well, these people may be wrong, but it's printed there that they thought he was making equality, and our Saviour never disabused them. He went on to say it's true. He said, in answer to them, verse 19, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, and you might stop me and say, well, there you are. He's limited. But I say, there you're not, for you haven't read the verse yet. But what he seeth the Father do, have you seen what the Father does? Well, hold your hand a bit. He did. For what things soever he doeth, these also, notice the word also, doeth the Son likewise. Notice the word likewise. Could you ever say that you have seen the works of the Father and you can do them just the same? That's claiming equality. But the Father loveth the Son and showing him all things that he himself doeth. And then it goes on to say in verse 21, For as the Father raiseth up the dead to quicken it then, even so the Son quicken it, whom he will. And he's committed all judgment into the hands of the Son, and that's repeated in verse 27, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also. Why? because he's the son of man. Do you see what God has done? He's assured us that we're not going to be judged by an infinite, invisible, terror-striking God. We're going to be judged by one who is the son of man. Someone who knows what it is to live here and be subjected to temptation and know not where to lay his head. That's the one that's going to be the judge. The one who bore our sins in his own body on the tree. And so he raiseth the dead and quickeneth them. And, and all judge. And then it says in verse 23, all this is that all men should honour the Son even as they honour the Father. Now some folks have got a great difficulty there. 
But he says here, he that honoureth not the Son, honoureth not the Father which hath sent him. So if you withhold equal honour to the Son because you feel you can't do it, you're in a fix. Because you can't even honour the Father then. But if you honour the process, the mediation of Christ that was sent by the Father, then you're in line with his will and you may have to leave the rest with him. And so he says further down, verse 26, For as the Father hath life in himself. Now if you read the first chapter of this, John's Gospel, it says before ever he came into this world, in him was life. In him was life. But he came into this world as a man. So it says, For as the Father hath life in himself, that's inherent life, that's one of the greatest claims to Godhead that you can find. Independence of everything else, doesn't need to breathe, doesn't need to eat and drink, life in himself. So hath he given to the Son, this Son of his, to have life in himself. Well, I won't labour the point too much, but you see, what a tremendous issue there is connected with this word, the Son. Well now let's look at the uh, expression, the Son of God. Quite a number again, but I'll just give you one which comes in our epistle to the Ephesians. Chapter 4. In chapter 4 there's the unity of the Spirit, and in that the central figure is the one Lord, verse 5, chapter 4. Then that's followed by the unity of the faith. Chapter 4, verse 13. And the central figure there is the knowledge of the Son of God, the perfect man. God, man. And the word knowledge is the word which is translated many times, acknowledge. The unity of the faith is the acknowledgement of the Son of God, with a view to a perfect man. The perfect man may have reference, of course, to the constitution of the church, but it's associated with the Son of God who is the head. So you see, he, right in the very climax of truth, as the epistle to the Ephesians is, the central figure is the acknowledgement of the Son of God. For there we have Many passages where you have the word, the Son of Man. And I think I mentioned to you before that the word Son doesn't always refer to birth or begetting. It refers to the idea of setting forth a character. So you get the Son of Perdition. Or you get in the Old Testament a well-cultivated olive plantation called the son of oil. The same expression from another angle is the word father. People get rather mixed up when it says unto us a son, unto us a son is born, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and he should be called the mighty God, the everlasting father. How can he be the father if he's the son? But it's the other way around. He's the father of the ages. The same as in the early chapters of Genesis, so and so is called the father of all those who handle the harp and the organ, or who work in metals. They're the originators, they are the beginners, they are the first ones. And then while we have Ephesians open, let's not forget the one that is so associated with our own blessing, Ephesians 1. Most of you know that Ephesians 1 3, verse 3 to verse 14, introduces the peculiar character of the blessings that belong to this new company. No other church in the New Testament is blessed in heavenly places where Christ sits at the right hand of God, so they're never even mentioned. No other part of scripture uses the expression in heavenly places. You'll find the word heavenly, of course, in all parts, but you won't find in heavenly places. They come only in Ephesians five times and nowhere else. And then it says, 
we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. And the only reference to the footsteps before the foundation of the world is to Christ. Thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. John 17. And Christ is verily set forth as a lamb without blemish and without spot before the foundation of the world. But all other callings are dated from since the foundation of the world, or as it's put, from. And then we have the refrain, verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace. And that refrain comes again, you see, at the end of verse 12, that we should begin in verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory. And again at the end of verse 14, unto the praise of his glory. So, it punctuates this opening section by saying, by putting it like this. In the first section, we have the will of the Father, choosing and accepting and blessing. Then we have work of redemption. That's the work of the Son. For that needed a body, and it needed blood to be shed. And then we have the witness of the Spirit. Father, Son, Spirit. All associated with your salvation and your inheritance and your access and your blessing, friends. Because he had a purpose. And that purpose included poor wretches like ourselves being taken, as it were, from the dunghill and set among princes, as the Old Testament puts it. Well, here we have a passage then which refers to Christ in his name and his capacity as a son. It says in verse 6, um, the, this chapter, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. But it doesn't even use the word son, just leaves it. But in the parallel passage in the epistle to the Colossians, it says, I think it is in chapter 113, the son of his love. So just look to make sure who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Well, that's wonderful enough. For we are accepted in that dear Son. But the actual words are, in the Son of his love. So while the references to the Son of God are not many in these epistles, they're very precious when they do come. And then, if you will turn back again, to Romans, the first chapter. I think there's a point there that you might be wise to ponder with regard to the Sonship of Christ. It says um, in verse 3, Concerning his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh, well, now, if Christ were only a man, what's the idea of telling us that he was made of the seed of David according to the flesh? How could he be made of the seed of David anyway? You wouldn't expect anyone to ex that I would put in my autobiography that according to the flesh I was born in Bermondsey. Well, I said, goodness me, how, uh, how could you come into this world except in the flesh? But this one's the exception. He's declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection. And so we have the emphasis upon that fact. And then, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, the Apostle Paul calls out attention that you could preach Jesus Christ as the seed of David from more angles than one. And that may be wise for us to remember. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 8. Remember, that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer as an evildoer. What do you mean by that, Paul? Well, he says, Jesus Christ was raised from the dead according to Matthew's gospel, or Peter's gospel, as the descendant of David to sit upon the throne of his father David. But he said, the same Saviour, who is the same seed of David according to my gospel, is to sit at the right hand of God far above all principality and power in the heavenlies. So, don't to depreciate him. Give him his full honour. He's king 
of kings and Lord of lords. And then chapter Romans, the, um, the 8th chapter, verse 29, gives him another title with regard to this sonship. It says in verse 29, or oh, verse 26, So we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. I've had people go off what they call the deep end when they heard the word predestinate. But you see, if they received a solicitor's letter and said, would they call round to the house of their old uncle who died? He's going to read the will. They wouldn't go off the deep end because their uncle had predestinated them to have a thousand pounds put to their account in the bank, would they? You see, this isn't, this isn't an election that's taking anything away from anybody. This word predestinate means to mark off beforehand. It contains in it the word horizon, a line in the distance. And if man can make a will and leave somebody something, God can make a will and leave somebody something without anyone going off the deep end over it. So, whom he did for an O, he also did mark off beforehand, what for? To be conformed to the image of his son. Anybody going to quarrel with that? Oh, what a blessing to think that one day it, this poor sin-stricken, striving world will have passed away and those of the left in heaven or on earth will in some way be conformed to the image of his son and he will be the firstborn among many brethren. Now this plot means and the lights are going and I've got to stop. But I do think it's wise for us to say to ourselves sometimes what did he of Christ? Whose son is he? And you know how the question was put to the the uh, Pharisees or those who were there. He said, if, if David called him Lord, how is he his son? And you know what they did? They walked away, they got no answer. If David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And if you can explain what comes in the last chapter of the Revelation, you're a better man than I am. For it says his title is the root and the offspring of David. Do you know anybody who could be possibly the root of his own ancestor? You see, we're up against the difficulty even of inspired language to make things plain. But it's not intended to make things plain. It's telling you. The exploration waits for us when we shall be better fitted to enter into the mystery of godliness. For the time being, let's rest upon the fact that our salvation and all our hopes are vested in this Son of God and God who is invisible and beyond all our ability to comprehend. And we poor creatures down here are all of us focusing upon him, his work, his person, and his glorious triumph.